So this lecture is part of a course on the theory of numbers and will be about the Chevalet warning theorem. And I should say, by the way, that Warning was a German mathematician, so his name was probably pronounced something like Werning. But the trouble is, since his name is actually an English word, it's incredibly difficult to remember the correct pronunciation. So I'm just going to use the normal English pronunciation of this with vague apologies to anybody German. So the problem is the following. Very general problem. Given a polynomial f, in several variables, x1 up to xn, does f have a root? Um, we also might want to ask, does f have a non-zero root? Um, by which we mean, can we find a1 up to an such that f of a1 up to an is equal to zero? with a i not all zero. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to take f to be a polynomial to have coefficients that are integers modulo some prime p. And of course, the a i and the x i are also going to be integers modulo p. In other words, we're taking f to have coefficients in the integers modulo p times the integers, which is a field often denoted by f sub p. So this is a, the easy examples of finite fields. Um, so we recall that congruence is modulo any number m can be sort of reduced to congruences modulo prime powers using the Chinese remainder theorem. And congruences modulo prime powers can be reduced to congruences modulo primes um, using Hensel's lemma quite often. Um, and congruences modulo primes have a lot of extra nice properties. And the Chevalier warning theorem is one of these nice properties that um, we can sometimes say that a polynomial has roots just by looking at its degree and um, the number of number of variables. Um, uh, no, notice, by the way, that over the reals there's nothing like this, because if we take a polynomial like 1 plus x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared plus x4 squared and so on, then um, then no matter how many variables we add, it's not going to have roots. Um, so the, 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 the idea is that a polynomial is more likely to have roots if you have more variables. That's sort of pretty obvious. The more variables you have, the more chance there is of having a root. Um, in particular, if the number of variables is large compared to the degree, then you expect roots. And, and this is a sort of common theme in number theory that if, if the number of variables is large enough compared to the degree, then you can quite often find solutions. Um, a famous example is the problem of writing an integer as the sum of um, nth powers. For instance, any integer can be written as the sum of four squares. And again, you can write any integer as the sum of nth powers, provided the number of nth powers is large compared to n. So this is a famous theorem due to Hilbert. Um, so, um, what does the Chevalier warning theorem say? Well, um, um, one version of it says that suppose the number of variables of f, x1 to xn, is greater than the degree. Um, if the constant term is equal to zero, then there is a non-zero solution. So by non-zero solution, we mean f a1 up to a n is equal to naught. Um, not all the a i are equal to congruent to zero. And of course, if the constant term is zero, then um, we have the zero solution with all the x i equal to zero. So, so when the constant term is zero, we're usually interested only interested in solutions that aren't identically zero. And there's um, 
So this, this version of it is sort of just a chevalet and warnings version of it says that the number of solutions is divisible by p. And that applies even if whether or not the constant term is zero. Now, now you see if the constant term is zero, um, we know there's at least one solution which is zero. And so the, the number of solutions is not zero. So the number of solutions must be at least p. So there must be some other solutions other than the, other than the trivial one. So this version of it implies this version. Um, so to prove this, we're, we're first going to prove a lemma. So we first show that, um, suppose we look at the sum over all integers x modulo p of x to the i. Then this is congruent to 0 mod p if naught is less than root to i is less than p minus 1. And you might think, what happens if i is equal to p minus 1? Well, if i is equal to p minus 1, then by Fermat, x to the i is congruent to 1 if x is not congruent to 0. So this sum here becomes 0 plus 1 plus 1 and so on plus 1, which is congruent to p minus 1, which is congruent to minus 1. So it definitely fails for i equal to p minus 1. In fact, more generally, um, this sum is actually equal to minus 1 if p minus 1 divides i and i is not congruent to, so i is not equal to 0 and it's equal to 0 otherwise. And by the way, the convention here is that 0 to the 0 is equal to 1. Um, so people sometimes argue a bit about what 0 to 0 ought to be. You, you could say it's supposed it ought to be 0 because 0 to the anything is equal to 0 and it ought to be 1 because anything to 0 is equal to 1. And most of the time it's more convenient to choose 0 to the power of 0 to be equal to 1. There are a few rare occasions when this is a little bit irritating and in fact this is one of the times because um, you notice we have this sort of exception that this rule breaks down when i is equal to 0. And the reason it breaks down is that we're setting 0 to the 0 equal to 1. And if we had 0 to the 0 being 0, then we wouldn't have this little glitch. So um, it's a sort of um, 0 to the power of 0 is always a little bit annoying. Um, so before proving this, let, let's just look at an example. Let's just take p equal 5 and look at the sum of the zeroth powers. Well, here we get 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, which is 5. If we look at the sum of the first powers of x, we get 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, which is 10. If we look at the sum of the squares, we get 0 plus 1 plus 4 plus 9 plus 16, which is 30. If we look at the sum of the cubes, we get 0 plus 1 plus 8 plus 27, plus um, 64, which is uh, 100. And if we look at the sum of x to the 4, we get 0 plus 1 plus 16 plus, um, plus 81 plus 256, which is uh, something like 354. And now you notice that these are all 0 mod 5, and this one here is minus 1 mod 5 as predicted by, by our, our theorem or lemma or whatever. Well, this is quite easy to prove. So since i is less than p minus 1, we can pick a not congruent to 0 with a to the i not congruent to 1. And what's the reason for this? Well, x to the i is congruent to 1, has at most i which is less than p minus 1 roots. Um, and there are p minus 1 non-zero elements mod p, so um, at least one of them, a to the i, is not equal to 1 mod p. And now we write s equals sum of x to the i, where x is taken mod p, and this is congruent to sum over ax to the i over x 
mod p. And the reason for this is that x goes to ax is a bijection of the integers modulo p. That's because a is non-zero, so it's got an inverse. And this is congruent to a to the i times sum over x to the i over x mod p rather obviously. So we find s is congruent to a to the i s mod p. And since a to the i is not congruent to 1, this actually implies that s must be equal to 0 mod p, which is what we wanted to prove. OK, so now we can um, prove the Chevalier warning or Werning theorem. So um, what we're going to do is to count the number of solutions to f x1 up to xn is congruent to zero, where x1 up to xn are in the integers modulo p. And what we notice is, first of all, f x1 up to xn to the p minus 1 is congruent to zero if x1 up to xn is a root, and it's congruent to 1 if not. And this follows by Fermat's theorem, because any non-zero number to the power of p minus 1 is congruent to 0. So the number of solutions is congruent to sum over x1 up to xn of 1 minus fx1 up to xn to the power of p minus 1. Because this term here is 1 if x1 up to xn is a root, and it's 0 otherwise modulo p. Um, and now let's take a look at uh, this bit here. So here the degree is equal to the degree of f times p minus 1, which is less than n times p minus 1, because we assume the degree of f is less than the number of variables. And now if we expand this out, each term is going to be some constant times x1 to the d1, x2 to the d2, and so on, and where d1 plus d2 and so on is now going to be less than n times p minus 1, because the degree is less than that. So some di must be less than p minus 1, because otherwise the, the sum would be at least equal to n times p minus 1. And now if we look at the sum over all x1 up to xn of x1 to the d1 times xn to the dn, this must be naught because the sum over um, xi of xi to the di is equal to zero. And we can do the sum over xi first, and that, 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 that's going to give us uh, a zero every time we do it. So uh, this sum here is congruent to zero mod p, because it's sum of, um, because, because every monomial that occurs in here is, uh, becomes zero if you sum it over all x1 up to xn. That also applies to the constant term 1, of course. Um, so that proves the Chevalier um, warning theorem that the total number of solutions is always divisible by p. Um, well, let's see a couple of examples. Let's take p equals 2 um, and let's look at x, y, z plus x squared y plus y squared z plus c squared x plus x cubed plus y cubed plus c cubed. Now you can see here that the degree is equal to the number of variables, which is equal to 3. And there are no non-zero solutions to uh, this equation being equal to 0. So if the degree is equal to the number of variables, the theorem breaks down. The number of solutions is not necessarily divisible by p number of solutions just one because the only solution is um, x equals y equals z equals zero.
Um, more generally, um, I, you can give an example um, for any prime where the degree is equal to the number of variables. Um, for this, we need to know something about finite fields of order p to the n. So if I take the finite field of order p to the n, it's got a norm which takes a1 x1 plus a n x n to z modulo p z. Here, a, a1 up to a n is a basis for the finite field f p to the n over f p. And then the norm um, has degree n in n variables, but um, has no non-trivial solutions because the norm of a non-zero element of this finite field is non-zero. So we can always find um, polynomials of degree n in n variables that don't have non-zero solutions. So the condition the number of variables must be greater than the degree um, is in some sense the best possible condition. Um, so I will just finish by saying a little bit about the history of this theorem and how, how it was found. So um, so first of all, in 19, about, about 1933, the Chinese mathematician Sen, um, I'm afraid my pronunciation of Chinese is even worse than for German, so whatever, um, proved that if k is the function field of a curve, um, then k is quasi algebraically closed. Well, what does that mean? Well, it just means any non-constant homogeneous polynomial in n variables with the number of variables greater than the degree has a non-zero root. Which is very similar to the result of the Chevalier warning theorem, of course. And I think Artin noted that a consequence of this is that any central division algebra over k is just k. So a central division algebra means a division algebra that's finite dimensional over k and whose centre is exactly k. And there's a famous theorem by Wedderburn, Wedderburn, I've been told off for pronouncing this in a German way when it's actually Scottish, um, says that the same is true for finite fields k, that any central finite dimensional central division algebra over a finite field must be equal to k. So Artin asked, well, he, th th this suggested to Artin that maybe finite fields were also quasi-algebraically closed because this would sort of give another proof of Wedderburn's theorem. And what he did is he gave this, this problem to Warning, who was a student of his, in order to do as his PhD thesis. And um, one day Chevalier was passing through and just asked what, what people were working on and immediately solved Warning's PhD problem, which is actually kind of a, a bit of a social error. You're, you're not supposed to solve the PhD problems of PhD students because it leaves them with nothing to do. So that was a little bit tactless of Chevalier. Um, so so that's, that, that, that's, that was the original motivation for the theorem. And what was a little bit odd about this is that Sen actually proved this result for function fields before Chevalier and Warning proved it for finite fields. Um, and the result is actually a lot easier to prove for finite fields than for function fields. So in some sense, these, these results were proved the wrong way round. <laughs>